Several hours east of the Rocky Mountains for which Colorado is famous, nestled in the rolling hills and canyons of the state's eastern edge, lies the site of one of the bloodiest conflicts between the United States Army and the native tribes of the Western Plains. In the years during and immediately after the Civil War, westward expansion had slowed greatly, as prospective settlers found themselves occupied by more pressing concerns. During this time, the native tribes of the plains began to form alliances with one another, with the intent of driving out the white settlers and preventing future incursions. When the war ended and westward expansion began again in earnest, these tribes were once again pushed back from ancestral lands, but this time they were more organized in their resistance. In the years between 1865 and 1868, the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes worked together to raid homesteads and railroads throughout the areas of northeast Colorado, northwest Kansas, and southwest Nebraska. The attacks may have been in part a response to the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864, when a 700-strong Colorado militia force attacked and destroyed a Cheyenne and Arapaho village, killing and wounding many, including both women and children. Indeed, the great Native American warrior Roman Nose, who participated in many of these raids and would play a major role in the Battle of Beecher Island, joined the Cheyenne Dog Soldiers as a direct result of the massacre. Because of the swift-moving nature of the Native cavalry, it was difficult for the regular U.S. Army to respond to attacks. Combined with the landscape, which affords numerous places for both horses and men to disappear among hills and small canyons, the army quickly grew frustrated. In August 1867, after a distinguished career in both the Civil War and in conflicts with Native Americans in Texas, General Philip Sheridan was appointed head of the Department of the Missouri, an area of approximately one million square miles between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Working to try and stop the raiding, Sheridan authorized the formation of a special unit, which would be charged with finding and destroying the raiding parties. The unit would be comprised of 50 frontiersmen scouts, under the command of Colonel George Forsyth, with Lieutenant Fred Beecher as his second-in-command. Forsyth recruited 30 of the scouts in the vicinity of Fort Harker, Kansas, and the remaining 20 came from the Fort Hayes area. The scouts made their way west without incident, arriving at Fort Wallace on September 5th, where they learned of a recent raid on a railroad line. Leaving Fort Wallace on September 10th, Forsyth and his men followed the trails left by the raiders north and west until they arrived at what is now known as Beecher Island. Along the trail, Forsyth saw signs of a much larger party of Native Americans than the 25 that had been reported during the raid, but he was determined to engage with the enemy. On the evening of September 16th, the scouts stopped for the night on the banks of the Arikari River, which ran through a broad valley. Forsyth noted an island in the middle of the river, about 60 yards long and 30 yards wide. At dawn on the morning of the 17th, a small party of mounted warriors attacked the camp. The goal of this attack was to stampede the scouts' horses and pack mules, leaving them without supplies and transportation. Fortunately for Forsyth and his men, all but seven of the horses and mules had been picketed the night before, allowing the scouts to quickly secure their mounts. After a quick skirmish with no casualties on either side, the Native American warriors retreated. Forsyth, realizing that this was merely the opening act of what would become a much larger battle, ordered his men to retreat to the island in the middle of the stream and begin digging defensive positions. As dawn gave way to day, the scouts looked up from their hastily made fortifications to see what must have seemed like a nightmare. Rather than the 25 or so raiders they were supposed to be tracking, an estimated 750 Native American warriors, armed and ready, had taken up positions on the heights to the north and west. Today, you can stand on the ridge from which the great Native American warrior Roman Nose planned his attacks on Forsyth scouts. The river valley has changed in the intervening years, but you can still get a sense of what it must have been like for the scouts to look up from the river valley below and see the massed troops, fully armed, ready to ride down upon them. The first attack came quickly, and two scouts were killed and several more wounded before the makeshift earthworks could be completed. Forsyth himself was shot in the right thigh as he oversaw the completion of fortifications, the first of three wounds he would receive during the battle. The scouts were able to turn away the first attack in no small part thanks to their seven-shot Spencer repeating rifles, which allowed them to return withering fire to the more exposed native troops, who were mostly armed with an assortment of single-shot muskets and rifles. By the end of the first attack, Forsyth had again been wounded, this time by a musket ball which shattered his left leg. In addition, the company's surgeon, Dr. Moores, was mortally wounded. He would drift in and out of consciousness for two more days before finally succumbing to the wound. All of the horses which had made it to the island died in that first attack. The scouts now truly had no way out. The situation was looking grim for Forsyth's men, and while they had driven off the first charge, they knew there would be another one, and this time it would be led by Roman Nose himself. Around noon on the 17th, the scouts noticed a gathering of native leaders atop one of the nearby hills. Shortly thereafter, a group of several hundred mounted warriors lined up downriver of the island, with Roman Nose at their head. 
The remaining foot soldiers surrounding the rest of the island prepared to provide covering fire for the charge. Romanos is one of the most famous personalities of the Plains Wars. He was the tallest Native American soldier many U.S. soldiers had ever seen, standing at least six feet tall. This, combined with a distinctive aquiline nose, made him easy to pick out from across a battlefield. After the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864, he became an important figure to the Northern Cheyenne tribe, as well as other tribes in the area, and was known for both his bravery and ferocity in battle. He was also deeply spiritual, and believed that his medicine man had given him a war bonnet that would protect him from bullets, so long as he met two conditions. One, that he never shake hands with a white man, and two, that he never eat food that had been prepared with iron. According to the legends surrounding the battle, several days before the fight at Beecher, he had been a guest at a nearby Sioux camp, where he unwittingly ate bread that had been cooked with an iron fork, removing his protection. The fight at Beecher broke out before he could cleanse himself, and if you believe the story, he led the second charge at Beecher convinced that he would die before the day was out. As the second charge began, a shower of bullets rained down on the island from all sides as the Native American soldiers attempted to provide cover for their exposed compatriots. By this point, however, the scouts had completed some simple but effective sand and gravel earthworks, rendering most of the bullets ineffectual. Again, the Spencer rifles proved their worth. According to most sources, the second charge got to within yards of the scout's position before breaking to either side of the island. Roman Nose's fears proved prophetic. He was one of the first Native American soldiers to fall during the charge. Writing in the San Francisco Chronicle in 1872, General George Custer provides a second-hand account of the charge. Seeing that the little garrison was stunned by the heavy fire of the dismounted Indians, and rightly judging that now, if ever, was the proper time to charge them, Roman Nose and his band of mounted warriors with a wild, ringing war whoop echoed by the women and children on the hills started forward. On they came, presenting, even in the brave men awaiting the charge, a most superb sight. Brandishing their guns, echoing back the cry of encouragement of their women and children on the surrounding hills, and confident of victory, they rode bravely and recklessly to the assault. Soon they were within the range of the rifles of their friends, and of course the dismounted Indians had to slacken their fire for fear of hitting their own warriors. This was the opportunity for the scouts, and they were not slow to seize it. Now, shouted Forsyth, now, echoed Beecher, McCollin, and Grover, and the scouts springing to their knees and casting their eyes coolly along the barrels of their rifles opened on the advance of the Indians, as deadly the fire is the same number of men ever yet poured from an equal number of rifles. Unchecked, undaunted, on dashed the warriors. Steadily rang the clear, sharp reports of the rifles of the frontiersmen. Roman knows the chief is seen to fall dead from his horse. Then Medicine Man is killed, and for an instant the column of braves, now within ten feet of the scouts, hesitates, falters. A ringing cheer from the scouts who perceived the effect of their well-directed fire, and the Indians begin to break and scatter in every direction. After the second charge, Forsyth turned to one of his most experienced scouts, a man by the name of Abner Grover. Can they do any better than that? he asked. I have been on these plains, boy and man, for twenty years, and I never saw anything like it, answered the scout. Then we have got them, replied Forsyth. It would not prove to be that easy. In the attack, two more scouts were killed, including the second-in-command, Lieutenant Beecher, for whom the island the scouts fought on would later be named. In addition, eight were too wounded to carry on fighting and several more were injured. Of the fifty he started out with, Forsyth now had about thirty-five that were still in fighting condition. The soldiers surrounding the island continued to pepper the scouts with fire, but were reluctant to charge, having sustained heavy casualties of their own during the first two engagements. Instead, they continued to surround the island, and as night fell, Forsyth realized what had been a series of heated engagements was turning into a siege. Despite his troops' bravery, Forsyth knew that his company of soldiers was in trouble. That morning, during the sunrise raid, his four pack mules had been driven off, and with them went most of the company's dry provisions and spare ammunition. He knew that if reinforcements didn't come soon, his troops would eventually succumb, either to overwhelming numbers or to starvation. The only food source at hand were the corpses of the horses they had led onto the island that morning, and in the late summer sun they would soon be rotting. The nearest source of relief was Fort Wallace, some 110 miles away, but it was their only hope. On the night of the 17th, he ordered two of his most experienced scouts, Jack Stilwell and Pierre Trudeau, to sneak through the enemy lines under the cover of darkness and make their way on foot to the fort. The scouts managed to leave the camp, but once out of earshot, Forsyth couldn't know if or when they would manage to find help. The day of September 18th saw a renewal of hostilities with several more Native American casualties. The scouts suffered no more dead, but still had many wounded among them. That night, Forsyth tried to send out another pair of scouts, but they had to turn back, finding no way through the enemy lines. By the 19th, the native plan had become clear. Starve the scouts out. 
Again on the 19th, Forsyth dispatched two scouts to Fort Wallace, Jack Donovan and Allison Piley. Like the first party, these two did not return, and the remaining scouts could only wonder as to their fate. The scouts carried the following message, outlining the status of the island. To Colonel Bankhead or Commanding Officer, Fort Wallace. I sent you two messengers on the night of the 17th instant, informing you of my critical condition. I tried to send you two more last night, but they did not succeed in passing the Indian pickets and returned. If the others have not arrived, then hasten at once to my assistance. I have eight badly wounded men to take in, and every animal I had was killed, save seven which the Indians stampeded. Lieutenant Beecher is dead. Acting Sergeant Moores probably cannot live the night out. He was hit in the head Thursday and has not spoken but one rational word since. I am wounded in two places, in the right thigh and my left leg is broken below the knee. The Cheyennes alone number 450 or more. Mr. Grover says they have never fought so before. We are living on mule and horse meat and are entirely out of rations. If it were not for so many wounded, I would come in and take the chance of whipping them if they attack. They are evidently sick of their bargain. I can hold out for six days longer if absolutely necessary, but please lose no time. The scouts endured five more days in this manner surrounded on all sides by a hostile force and eating meat from increasingly rotten horses. The river provided water, but the scouts must have wondered if they would ever leave the little island where they had made such a determined stand. Colonel Forsyth sent out no more scouts to try and reach Fort Wallace. He must have felt that even if the scouts made it, it would be too late to save his troops. On the morning of September 25th, several scouts noticed a large body moving to the south. The messages had gotten through. Despite leaving two days later, Scouts Donovan and Piley actually arrived at Fort Wallace an hour before Stillwell and Trudeau on September 22nd. Orders were immediately dispatched to Colonel G.H. Carpenter, who commanded Company H of the 10th U.S. Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers. Carpenter received the orders late on the 23rd and moved north to rescue Forsyth's men. Along the way, he met with a party of five men who had also been dispatched to find Colonel Bankhead, who was also in the vicinity, and who would arrive on the 26th to help evacuate the wounded. One of the members of this party was one of the scouts Forsyth sent out, which one is not recorded, who was able to give Colonel Carpenter directions to the battlefield. And so, on the morning of September 25th, he arrived with an advanced troop of 30 men. Upon seeing his arrival, the Native American forces dispersed quickly and Colonel Carpenter was able to provide much-needed relief in the form of food and medicine to Forsyth's scouts. All told, they had been on the island for nine days. One of the severely wounded scouts died on the 25th, bringing the death toll to five, with 17 more wounded. Of the Native Americans, it is said that at least 75 fell during the battle and perhaps twice as many more were wounded, some seriously. The Cheyenne tribe in particular was dealt a huge blow with the death of Roman Nose, one they would never fully recover from. These days, Beecher Island looks very different than it did back then. Numerous floods have changed the landscape. The island itself has been washed away entirely, and several buildings now stand near the battle site. The grounds are open 365 days a year for visitors. A monument was erected in 1898, and an association to preserve the site formed in 1899. A massive flood destroyed all but the base of the original monument, which was moved to higher ground and a new top was added, which gives a brief version of the story and lists the U.S. wounded and dead. President Theodore Roosevelt deeded the land surrounding the battlefield to the Beecher Island Memorial Association, and every year on the anniversary of the battle, people from all over come to a reunion to participate in two days of food, games, and storytelling, and to remember one of the fiercest and most desperate fights of the Plains Indian Wars.